I was very involved in the ministry up in Canyon Country, and there was probably 70 to 80 men that were on that property. And since, like from 97 to 2012, uh, once or twice a month, I went to the Bible Tabernacle. I've never been down here. I heard about Fred Hilt's testimony and his story uh, with feeding the homeless people and taking care of uh, people in these places and feeding I heard five, like a lot of people at Thanksgiving, and I heard of all those stories, but I had never been down here to Venice, to this church and this facility, and I see a face right there. I think I recognize, uh, I recognize Mike and a few other people, and it is, I'm, you guys have never seen me before. I love this ministry. Um, I know you, right? Yes, I recognize your face. You recognize me? Yeah. So I, I went up there with uh, a private Christian school I was with, and we would bring in a choir of 70 kids, and they would sing. And I said, you know, we need to care for people. And we'd bring them in a bus, and they would sing to the people. Uh, Christmas Eve, I would take my family. We're going to the Bible Tabernacle. We're going to go sing some Merry Christmas songs. Christmas Eve to the Bible Tabernacle and my wife had his her family there her brother from out of state and it was it was uh, a special place so I I loved being there and after the service I would make my way to the back of the room and I'd try to shake every man's hand at the back and say tell me a little bit about your story and then we would go down to the office there and I would spend some time praying with them and hearing their story and try to encourage them on the way so uh, it's great to be here. I got a call a, a week or two ago and said, I can't believe my phone's got the Bible Tabernacle going across my screen. So I said, I stopped everything. I said, I will take this call. What are you calling me for? And so I'm here, and um, I, it, is, it is It's good to see you guys and to be here. Um, it started when I was in college, and I went to, I was in a school in the, in the, on the East Coast, and I would go to, on Sunday mornings, I would go to a, a city jail and a county jail, and I would learn to preach, I would learn to teach, and it was the very first time, so there was a city jail and a county jail, and the city jail, I think there was people that were kind of like, they were in there from the night before kind of thing, and they were in these cells, and we would put these little speakers in all the different cells, and we would get up Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, and we'd start preaching to them and tell them who Jesus Christ is and how they could help them. And then um, after that service, we would go to the county jail, and it was in a courthouse, and there would be a bar, and people would be... And so this guy would say, all right, all right, Swales, it's your time to turn to lead a song in worship. And I'm like, you know how they would do this back in the day? They would do the little arm motion. And I was like, okay, let me learn how to lead someone in singing a song. And now it's your turn to share your testimony, Derek. And I said, What's, how do I do that? And so then, you know, it just developed. And I, I just loved those times together and, and saw people get saved, saw people accept who Jesus Christ is and ask them to forgive them for their sins. And I need a fresh start. And, it happened, it was real. I saw the word of God alive. And so those were special moments for me, um, growing my faith and my opportunities to, to allow God to use me. So I'm here for, uh, to talk to you. And when I think of Venice, um, I think of uh, uh, the rings. You guys down on this, what do you call the boardwalk? What is that section called? Muscle Beach. Muscle Beach. And I look at those rings, and every time we've gone down there, we, we see someone grabbing one ring. How, how many of you, anybody in here tried those? Have you tried it? So it's a, it's a hoop. It's kind of like a, a, a bunch of rings. And then you grab this ring, and then you have to get your momentum going to get the next ring. And once you get onto the two, these guys are doing one of these, right? Okay. Am I in the right place? Okay. So, 
<laughs> and so you have to get this momentum, right? You guys with me? So the Christian life is much like, you know, there's a process to this. If, if you're going to come to a ministry like this, and all of a sudden you want your life just fixed in a minute, it, it doesn't happen. It is like, okay, listen, let's, let's talk, let's understand the Bible, let's understand who Jesus Christ is, and let's grab onto a ring, and then let's get another ring, and, and let's, start, let's start this momentum, this journey to where? To the next ring, and to the next ring, and the next ring. And honestly, like if you miss a ring, like sometimes your hands are tired, and what happens? You're done. You got, and you got to start all over again. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the first ring. All right, am I ready? And you kind of got to build yourself up again. I'm like, am I ready to do this? You grab onto that ring, and you say, okay, I think I can learn a little bit from my last try, and I got to stay focused. And I've got to keep my eye on the prize and the next, the next ring. And I've got to stay in this rhythm. I've got to stay. I can't get off. I've got to stay focused to this path. Are you guys with me? How many, maybe, you can do, maybe we haven't done the rings in Venice. But you remember, everybody remembers their monkey bars, right? Remember the monkey bars in, in elementary school? And you get their little calluses right across here because you just kept, like, I want to do these monkey bars. And you, you grab the one monkey bar, you get to the next one, and what do you want to do after you get to the first one? What makes it go faster? Oh, you can skip a ring. Remember that? So you're not just going to grab this one, you're going to get the, the next ring, and boy, you're just going to fly down. That's next level monkey bars. <laughs> so, listen, this process of life and walking this journey, it, it's, there's a rhythm to this. And if you think you can get to a place where it's, li listen to me, listen. Some of the toughest rings down the road are, well, let's go to the Beatitudes and let's find out, okay? Let's go to the Beatitudes. Um, you know, when I want to talk to you about some things that you need to put in your life. When Jesus came to the people, he said to them, I want to tell you how to do this life. Do you think you're going to listen to Jesus? You're going to listen to Jesus. Jesus is going to come to a place where he's going to say, blessed are the poor. Look at me. I, I am not coming to you pulling out a verse that I am just like, hey God, let me help, let me talk to the Bible Tabernacle, let's do this today. No, the last four months, I have been trying to figure out the Beatitudes, okay? So I had a little talk with some people about two weeks ago, guess what I talked to them about? Three weeks ago, guess what I talked to them about? Hey, I'm in this journey, but because this is a process. I'm not, I'm not just going to like, oh, memorize this verse and go on to a next one. I want to get into the word. I want to understand it because it works. It works. It's true. It's alive. I've been doing this book. I've been living and trying to understand this book since, I mean, I got saved when I was five years old. Okay. Um, so 50 years ago or so. But I really started purposing in my heart to understand this last few years of high school going into college. I said, God, I'm all in. You know, my testimony started off when I was, I grew up in Canada. Okay, so my mom was American and my dad was Canadian. So I was born to a Canadian father with a Canadian father and an American mom. So I have a dual citizenship. It's true dual citizenship. So I have an American passport and a Canadian birth certificate, okay? So I remember going off to camp and uh, it, it's kind of like a little retreat like this where you're trying to get away from everything and get started again. And I remember going to camp and this, this camp, Minioe, um, they put all these counselors in a room and 
they started praying. And I was like, oh, geez, here we go. You ever been in one of those meetings around here? We have to hold hands, and next time it's, it's your turn to pray. Oh, man, what am I supposed to pray? I don't know how to pray. So I was finishing up high school, and they said, okay, here it comes, my turn to pray. And I remember saying, Lord, you know, if you, if you would really forgive me, would you, would you use me? Oh, man. So that next week, I had a, you know, you have the camp, right? You got, this was an overnight camp. So we had the cabins with canvas windows. Okay, that was a pretty nice cabin. We didn't think about air conditioning or anything like that. We just had canvas windows that you could roll up and roll down and lots of air would blow through them. And I had these campers, they were probably 10 years old. And we did one of these transitional campfires where it was silly and crazy and then it would go into something serious. And they would do a skit on becoming a Christian. And I thought, okay, this is the first week of camp. And this late, these guys said, would you like to become a Christian? And so that night, these kids came to my cabin, and they're little squirrely kids, and we're supposed to go to bed. I had to ask them what question. I said, like, how many of you want to become a Christian? Guess how many hands went up? There's like two or three kids. I think these two put their hand up, and then this kid over here said, I'm going to do it too. And I sat there, and I was like, it's on. What am I going to do? And I remember, you know, the Bibles that had those little tracks in them. And I'd grown up in a, in a good Christian home, and I was like, okay, I don't want to mess this up. And I opened up that little track, and I went through the different verses to help someone become a Christian. And what did I pray the week before? God, if you would forgive me, what? Use me. And I thought, so I went to the camp director, Yvonne, I think her name was Yvonne McCallum. And I went up to her cabin in the morning and I went knock, knock, knock. And I said, hey, Yvonne, I think there was two or three kids that got saved last night. They asked Jesus to forgive them for their sins. And I prayed with them and she goes, how do you, how do you feel about that, Derek? And I walked out of that cabin and I fell to my knees on a dirt parking lot and I said, God, I'm all in. So I went to, um, went back after 10 weeks in the summer camp uh, doing, as a counselor. I, I went home to high school. And I told my friends, I said, I'm all in. And I, I got baptized. I, I invited them. I said, there'd be really good food. <laughs> and, they, you know, they would have a place just like here. We're downstairs in the basement. They'd have some really good food. And I remember sitting in that baptismal and saying, I want, to, I want you guys to know that Jesus, I'm living for the Lord, I'm all in. So when you start this process, guys, you get a hold of the ring, you, you say, Lord, if you can save a wretch like me, I'm all in. And then you start, and then you fall, and then you start, and you fall. But guess what? I'm still in the game. And I want to share with you some of the things that I'm learning from the Beatitudes. Okay? So if you have your Bibles, I'm not sure if they have it on the screen. Um, but the Beatitudes are where Jesus came to his disciples and he was going to teach them. And there's definitely a process that I want to discuss with you. But I want you guys to, I want you to look at me for a minute. Because I want to put pressure on myself and I want you guys to see that you have to memorize and meditate on these verses for this to really work. Okay? So look, when I learn this, I learn, okay, blessed are the, okay, there's a P and two M's and then an H and then another P and a couple M's and, and a, like, look at me. I look at these verses when I go to bed at night, even last night, I say, Lord, I want to learn these verses. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are those that are meek. Okay, so I hang on to those three and then I know there's an H. 
Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then I know there's re three really hard ones. You know what they are? Purity, peacemakers, and merciful. And then there's a really, really hard one at the end. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness. Now, I'm telling you, those last four are hard. They're hard. But to get to hard, you think purity is easy? It's not. You think a peacemaker is easy? It's not. You think being cursed, persecuted is easy? No. You know what persecuted means? means people are hunting you. It's not like a bad day. This is persecuted is different back then. These people are trying to kill people because of the truth and the gospel that they're teaching. That's a different grind. Merciful, pure, peacemaker, persecuted. Those are the last four, aren't they? You know why I know those? Am I looking at my notes? I'm not looking at my notes. I'm talking to you guys about something that I'm learning. If you want to get to really learn how to forgive someone, I want to talk to you about that today. Is that hard? Brutal. Bitterness, anger at somebody, harboring that hurt turns into anger and bitterness where many are defiled. Don't think that you harboring that hurt is only going to hurt you. It's going to hurt who else? You're not winning. Purity? Are you kidding me? It's nonstop everywhere all the time. Access all the time. Peacemaking, merciful, persecuted. Okay, you with me? So we're going to get on the first rung and we're going to start swinging. And I'm going to go through the first blessed R. I'm going to go through another blessed R. And, and, and we have to stay focused on these three or four first blessed R's for you to get to ring number four, five, six, and seven. You with me? Okay. But you got to be real with me. You got to be real about these first three because these are the three you got to live on, live on, live on. You've got to live in the first three to get to ring number four, five, six, and seven. Okay? All right. So let me, let me open up my notes now, see if I've got everything. Um, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, when Jesus was teaching this, he was talking to all the people, including the Pharisees and disciples and people that were trying to get healed and the very first thing he said to them is, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, there had been a tendency at that time for if you were a Jew or you were a spiritual leader, you were going to heaven. And so Jesus was saying, it's not that you go to this church. It's not that you were born into this family. It's not that you were a descendant of, of Abraham. It's not all those things. And he was trying to change the mindset of the people in the room. He was like, no, no. I don't care if you are a Jew. I am here to save even Gentiles. Okay, so I want you to hear this because it's going to validate what I just said. Is that really true? So listen, Jesus shared the stories of Elijah and Elisha. There's two different people. Okay, Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, was she a Gentile or a Jew? She was a Gentile. Okay, so he's talking to these people saying, if you want to go to the kingdom of heaven, I don't, it's not about whether you go to this church or you've been born in this family or you are a Jew. He's saying that this lady said, I need God. And that is a poor in spirit. I'm not already there. I don't have everything. No, I need God. Poor in spirit. So this is what happened. Elijah and the, Elijah and the widow Zarephath, during a time of famine, God sent Elijah to, not to any of the widows in Israel. 
So his point is, there was a famine with all the Israelites, without food. And he didn't just go to his special chosen Jewish people. He went where? He went to a Gentile. Why is he teaching that? Because he's telling them, I don't care if you're a Jew. I am here to save people who are poor in spirit, not because you're part of this club or you grew up here or you went to this. You with me? That's the argument. He's here to say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, so he went to this Gentile woman in Sidon and helped her. Next one is Elisha. Now, does he know, do these people know who Elijah and Elisha is? Do you know who they are? You may not know who they are, but do these people know who they are? Yes, they do. These were great prophets, great men. So Elisha and Naaman, Naaman, similar to this, womb, this widow, was a Syrian general and a Jew or Gentile. Yeah, a Gentile. So he goes to that, this general, good guy, but not, not a person you'd think he'd go to because he's a Gentile, and cleansed him of what? Leprosy. Now, he's basically telling these people, hey, I'm here to help the widow who's really poor. I'm here to help the Gentile general. I want you to, um, I want you to think about this verse about who Jesus is, okay? Jesus is here to heal the brokenhearted and to set the captive free, okay? He is going to, listen to this, the prophet Isaiah in, in Isaiah 61 says, I am going to give unto them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy in the morning and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Listen to this, that they might be called the trees of righteousness. Now, I want you guys just to hang on for a second here and think about what Jesus is trying to do here. Jesus is trying to get these people to honestly look at themselves and to have an attitude that they need Jesus. You guys with me? Okay, so he basically is going to say, your first rung is, do you need Jesus? Okay, because it doesn't matter your backstory, it doesn't matter who you think you are or who you could have been, but he just wants you to come and say, like, I want, I need help, I need Jesus. And Jesus, look at me, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and to set the captive free. Listen, a lot of people think that Jesus is doing this at you. Don't do this and don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. But actually, Jesus is coming along to say, hey, you're like a reed that's broken. Have you ever seen a grass reed that's kind of flipped, like it's just about to break off? And, and he's here to not break the broken reed. There's a, another picture that Jesus quotes from Isaiah in Isaiah 61. It says, and he's here to not smolder the, the wick. So there's this little wick left in a fire, and he's not here to quench the wick. Jesus isn't here to break the broken reed. He's here to tenderly help you to help the brokenhearted and to set the captive free. Okay, so let's look at the next blessed are. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's the first rung. I love the way this ends. Um, listen to this. Before I met Jesus, I was prideful and self-reliant, thinking I could handle everything on my own. Have you guys ever been there before? Before I met Jesus, I was prideful and self-reliant, thinking I could handle everything on my own. But when I sur surrendered to him, I realized my need for his grace. Now I live with humility, depending on Jesus daily, 
and I experience the richness of his kingdom in, his li- in my life. That's blessed are the what? Poor in spirit. The next is blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Do you guys feel broken? Do you feel like that smoldering wick where you're like, I'm, but maybe not now, but maybe there's that moment where you're like, man, this is, I can't do this. Why does God put us into those times? It says here, blessed are those that mourn for they will be what? Comforted. Who wants to comfort you? He really does. Why do we have to learn this the hard way? Right? Why do we have to do, the, to do this the hard way? Again, Jesus isn't here to go like this and to condemn you and do this more and don't do this. He's here to say what? I'm here to comfort you. This ministry here is like a bunch of hands doing this. You see, there's a verse that says, bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. You know, there's a boulder in your life, could be health, sickness, that you cannot carry on your own. You can't carry it on your own. And you're like, wow, I I didn't even deserve this one. Like, this is out of my hands. And it's a big, big boulder. That word burden means boulder burden. There's another word that's talked about a backpack burden in the same passage. If you look up bear one another's burdens, there's another word that talks about your backpack And if you don't take care of your backpack, your own responsibilities, it could turn into a what? A boulder burden. You know what a boulder burden is? Bear one another's burdens. You have things that can come into your life that you cannot handle on your own. And God has put the Bible tabernacle, your mom, your friends, people, And you know, in your hardest time, it's not always the person that you think is going to show up, is it? Guess who shows up? Somebody else that has gone through that boulder. And they're going to come alongside you and comfort you. Was Jesus betrayed? You've been betrayed? You got to do something you don't want to do. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. One of the most beautiful things, listen, one of the most beautiful verses that I have in my office is Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. Listen, sometimes these boulder burdens come into your life so other people can come alongside you and help you carry that burden and so that you can understand the fellowship of Jesus, have an intimate, personal relationship with him. Because guess who's with you, and guess who has also gone through it too? Right? Blessed are those that mourn. Listen, the first two rings that I'm talking about is you got to need Jesus, and you've got to know that this is really hard. And you need comfort. And he's there to comfort you. And these hard things, this side of glory, are very intentional, aren't they? You know, have you been that person that says, I went through that really hard and I wouldn't change it for a thing? What, why? Because you, you've really grown. You've really grown and you've prioritized some things. You're like, man... I, I have such a, I would never have met the Lord Jesus. I would never have met these people. These are the first two rungs, guys. Listen, I, I haven't got to four, five, six, and seven yet, and eight. 
But you have to say, like, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. And this is really hard. Please help me. I need people in my life. They're going to help me. And then you can get ready to go for another, go for another ring. You with me? But you have to stay here. You lose step number one. I'm good, God. I got this. I don't need any help spiritually. We're done, right? What ring is that? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Ring number two is what? Blessed are they that mourn. This world is hard because this is not our home. This is not our home. God created this world beautiful and good. He created us in his image so we would see his character. We could see how things are supposed to be. But then what happened? Sin happened. And it got really bad. Isn't it interesting that God created everything good, allowed this sinful thing to happen so that Jesus Christ could be the hero and redeem all of it through the shed blood of Jesus Christ? God has a plan. It's not for this being our home. Are you satisfied here today? This world is not going to bring satisfaction. I need the Lord, okay? Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Okay, this is hard. I need to do this with the Lord. He's going to comfort me. I've got people in my life that can do it. What's the next rung? Let's go to the next, the third blessed. What is it? Listen to this beautiful, I love this. Listen to this before I go to three. Listen to this. Before I met Jesus... This is on um, Blessed Are Those That Mourn. Before I met Jesus, I was crushed by the weight of my sin and guilt. Mourning not just the brokenness of my life, but the deep separation from God. This mourning wasn't merely a personal grief, but a sorrow over a fallen state of my soul and the world around me. When I surrendered to Jesus, listen to this, he brought me a divine comfort that comes from knowing I am forgiven and reconciled by God. My mourning has turned to joy as he has given me beauty for ashes and now I live with a peace of his ongoing grace and mercy. You know, that comfort and that restoration of mourning your sin. Guys, listen. You know what the word restore means? An arm is broken. You know what the doctor has to do? Is it, is it fun and games? No. When he resets that, he wants to get it back in order so that when you turn... It's not going to be in pain for the rest of your life. So he's got to get it lined up. That restoration process is like a broken net that needs to be fixed. So it's restored. So it's useful again. So when you deal with sin and you mourn sin and you can see that you're breaking like a broken reed or a smoldering wick. Jesus is here to do what? Restore and reconcile. Okay, God, thank you for forgiving me. Man, I need you. You, ref you can fix this. You paid for my sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm good. Like, those are two good ones to hang on to, right? Now, let's get the momentum to go to blessed are the what? Now listen, you got to keep your mouth shut sometimes, don't you? <laughs> Amen? Sometimes you just need to walk away. Amen? That's some good practical advice. God, comfort me. I'm mourning. I really messed up. Fix me. Okay, now meekness is strength under control. A picture of meekness is the great horse with the reins coming out of the bit of the mouth and the horse is controlled by a little flick of the wrist and he can make the horse go left and right this massive horse meekness 
is strength under control. What is it about blessed art? Like, I, you know what? I think God is being God right now. Like, I think God is in control. I don't need to get in crazy and fix this guy's mouth and fix this lady that's crazy. No, 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 no. I, I'm just going to keep my mouth cl closed and I'm going to walk away. Is that meekness? Because who's in control? He's in control. Is that good advice? It's good advice. Does, does Mr. Swales need that? Yeah. It's really good advice. Wait, wait till you re read one of these examples here in my notes if I can get to it. Um, you know, uh, the counterculture, what does our culture want us to do? Really be assertive, really be loud, show all that confidence, bring your skill to the table. You know, and so many times in life, it doesn't, it's not always how skillful and how smart you are, by all due respect. Sometimes God is going to be God, is going to allow things to happen, not based on you controlling the situation. Do we want to control things? Yes, we do. You know, one of the most beautiful verses in, I, in um and Isaiah is soaring his wings of eagles. You guys love that verse? What's the first word of that verse? Wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. How much work am I doing in waiting? How much are you needed in waiting? Nothing. Listen, some of the wisest saints, some of the greatest Saints and believers aren't waxing eloquent all the time, talking all the verses. They are waiting on the Lord and allowing God to be who? I'm telling you, this is very difficult with children. This is very difficult with family. This is very difficult in ministry or in the workplace. Is Sometimes you just have to wait. Listen to um, the before and after of learning how to wait on the Lord or, or to um, be meek and under control. Before I knew Jesus, I was angry and power hungry, always striving to be in control. Does that sound like every one of us in the room? Right? But... Jesus taught me the value of meekness, and now I live with gentleness and peace. I have found that surrendering to him, I have gained so much more than I could have ever known. Blessed are the meek. I'm poor in spirit. God, I need you. I, I, I mess up. I know I'm very sinful. It's like I'm barely hanging in there, Lord. I'm like a reed bent over. I'm like a smoldering wick. Blessed are those that mourn. I'm meek. I'm going to stay under control. God, I want you to be God here. I can't fix this. I'm just in the room. God, let me wait on you. You guys with me? This next one is a special one. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know, when I'm hungry or, or thirsty, and I went camping with my son this summer, and we were fishing, and um, we, we almost ran out of, like, we weren't running out of water, but I was like, we ran out of water. Like, we can't stay another day. We don't have enough food and water. And I, I know, boy, I saw the, the meat that they're cooking downstairs and the food that you guys have. Like, can you, can you not, I mean, can you smell it? Man, that's rough in here. You can smell that meat that's getting cooked, and some of you guys are hungry, and you haven't eaten breakfast yet, and you're like, I can't wait till this message is over because I got some food and I'm hungry. But that, that, that longing, is it real? Man, when you get hungry or thirsty, there's one thing on your mind, isn't it? There's one thing on your mind. 
You know, I, I remember reading an illustration of someone that was hungering and thirsting, and they gave an analogy of somebody that went swimming and they were underwater and they couldn't get to the surface. Okay, obviously we're near the ocean, so this is a good analogy. And you know, you're holding your breath, you're holding your breath, you're holding your breath, and you're like, okay, I just, I gotta get up, I, I'm, I, I'm, I've gotta inhale. Holding your breath, and all of a sudden, when you get up out of the water, what do you do? You just gasp, like, oh, I can't believe I've been, I, I, I made it. Like that's hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Like it's your single focus, it's you have to, you're craving this one thing. And what is the one thing that we're craving for? You know, is there a day or a morning where you get up and you're not necessarily like, okay, Lord, what's in it for me? What, what do you want for me? I, I feel like I'm at a phase in my life right now where I, I really want to be in tune with hearing from God. Because I could do A, B, C, and D in my life, but I'm really trying to figure out what. I really do. I, I, I want to say, God, like I could spend a lot of time doing different things, but what's your plan? And all of a sudden, somebody comes in and talks to me about this, and somebody talks to me, I bump into this person, and I say, okay, Lord, I know I got to get this done and this done, but I think this is also on the table now. You guys hear me? That's... That's really hungering and saying, Lord, what do you want to do with my life? What is the right thing for me to do right now? When I look at hungering and thirsting after righteousness, do you remember my testimony? I told you um, when I started becoming a Christian, I, I purposed my heart to, listen, two words, do right. Like, I, I want to do right. Why do I want to do right? So I can make more money? No, I'm actually, I really don't put my mind on making money. I actually am trying to help people and understand how to be wise and do the right thing. Because I want to be part of kingdom work. I want to be part of God's plan. Hungering and thirsting after what? Righteousness. I want to do right. I want to understand God's word. Listen to this. Um, before I met Jesus, I was empty, restless, constantly searching for something to fill the void in my life. I was hungering for meaning, but was never satisfied. When I surrendered to Jesus, he filled me with his righteousness, giving me peace and purpose. Now I live with a deep sense of satisfaction, transformed by his grace and driven by, his, by a desire to reflect his character in everything I do. You know, if, if you ever walked up to Mr. Swales to do a funeral or to talk in a certain thing, my greatest satisfaction is from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. The verse is in my office, Philippians 3.10. Psalm 23, probably one of the greatest psalms ever written. It talks about, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, what? Want. I shall not want. What does that mean? I shall not want. He brings satisfaction, okay? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for who is with me. For thou art with thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There is satisfaction in knowing the Lord Jesus in good times. There is consolation of Christ in bad times, tough times. The satisfaction of Christ, the consolation of Christ, and watch this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There is the anticipation of Christ and his future of heaven. Guys, hungering and thirsting after righteousness for me is finding satisfaction in growing in the Lord Jesus in good times and bad times and to have the hope of how he can use me and help point other people 
for the anticipation of surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. There's great hope in the anticipation. Let's go from first one is blessed are the poor, blessed are those that mourn, blessed are those that what? Meek. Now we are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. God, help me to do the right thing. Help me to find satisfaction, food, like food and water. I just want to, I really want to know the Lord Jesus. I want to do the right thing, okay? The last three are the tough ones. Man, these ones are really hard. Blessed are the merciful. Well, they will be shown mercy. I, I'm just telling you, this one's hard, okay? Are you able to show compassion to people that have wronged you? It's hard. Man, Jesus, this, this is... Like, I, I wake up with this one in my mind. My, <laughs> if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. That's in Matthew 5 as well. What does that look like? Do this, do this, and do this. Okay, and now, and now I'm going to do it some more for you. Jesus was like, if someone hits you here, turn the other cheek. Like, why are we doing this? Is this fair? Is this just? Why, why are we doing this? You know why? Because God, cause you're pretty, we're pretty bad. God forgave us. And I mean, is this fair? And so we're, we're trying to teach someone mercy. We're going to have to show mercy to other people. This one's hard, isn't it? Forgiving someone. Guys, you know what forgiveness means? To cancel the debt. To take the mortgage and rip. Wouldn't that be nice if someone would cut up all the debt that you have and say, it's free, you're done. No more debt. You're like, wow, I'm free. Mercy is someone doing something that you don't deserve. Well, grace is getting something you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what you actually deserve. Like, you, 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 you owe this much, and we're going to cancel it. Like, there's some beautiful thoughts in mercy and grace. That's a good study. This one's hard. You want another hard one? Let me, let me read you the before and after of, I love these. I used to be bitter and unforgiving, holding on to grudges. Anybody there? I used to be bitter. You know what bitterness is? Harbored hurt. Hebrews says, and where people harbored hurt, it's like a gall of poison where many are defiled. Holding on to grudges. But after surrendering to Jesus, I experienced mercy and learned to extend that same mercy to others. Now I live with a heart full of forgiveness, knowing that I have been forgiven much. Has anybody forgiven you before? Man, how do you look at them now? Wow, they're different. They are built different. Let's go on to the next one. Now we're on to the hard rungs. Okay, another hard rung is, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, in my mind, I really want to be genuine and sincere with people. Blessed are the poor, of the pure. When you look at people, do you know they're the real deal? How do you know they're the real deal? Look, how do they talk when nobody else is around? Like, you know, Jesus wants you to be real. Like, not just here in church, like all the time. Person at the store, person with your, fam your family, your friends at church. Like, if you're going to carry the gospel and you want to see the power of God work in your life, all in, guys. You with me? <laughs> Is this hard? This is really hard. Blessed are the pure in heart. Those that are sincere, have integrity. They're going to maintain a clean and undivided heart. Okay, let's go to the last one. Is 
There's actually two, but this, this is really the a practical one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Can you guys listen to this one? Just Again, this is hard. Listen, when you have a conflict, you with me? When you have a conflict, you have two options, fight or flight. Death is at both spectrums. Suicide is flight option, and murder is the other death option. You with me? You either want to deal with this, and get angry and yell and scream and hit and punch, which leads to what? Murder, which is death. Or you're like, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to talk to you. I'm leaving it. I'm going to run away from this. And what happens? What? Suicide. So you have death and death. Murder or suicide. You know what a peacemaker does? You know what the middle ground is? Communicate, talk, listen, listen, listen to them. What do you think happened here? What do you think happened here? Okay, I don't think the temperature in the room's right right now, but we're gonna come back to this to another, another time. Let's talk about this, let's talk about this. What are we doing? We're doing really hard right now. This is one of those farthest rungs, dealing with conflicts. Meekness is tough, letting God be God. Purity is tough, being real. And then a peacemaker, is this easy? Peacemaker? Peacemaking, listen to this closing comment here. I was, in con- I was conflict driven and divisive. Always finding myself in arguments. You know that person? They're always right. Let me tell you. No, no. Let me tell you. Conflict, conflict, conflict. But after surrendering to Jesus, he made me a peacemaker, helping me to bring reconciliation where there was division. Now I live as a child of God, spreading peace wherever I go. And the final one is blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And I just want to read the final statement here. I used to be fearful of conforming, afraid to stand up for what is right, but after surrendering to Jesus, he gave me the courage to live righteously, even when it's difficult, and now I stand firm in my faith. I, I don't know if you have the endurance to do hard things, to do the right thing. I, I don't know if how, how well I would do if I was persecuted for my faith, but that's a big rung, isn't it? I don't think any of us want to be in that situation. But being persecuted for doing right things, like you guys are on the path to hear this, right? You're going to hear these good values about the blessed are. And you're going to start to adopt some of these different rings. But you know what? There's going to be a time where you're going to be tempted or someone's going to put a pressure situation in that's really hard. They're going to ask you a really tough question and you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be laughed at, mocked at. And maybe some of you, if you become a Christian, you would even lose family members. Is that hard? It's brutal. Oh, you go to that. You go to this. You believe this. You're crazy. That's really, really hard. Stay on those first three. When you take, open your Bibles up tonight or tomorrow, stay in blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the, get into that. Start hungering and thirsting after righteousness like this. The last breath you have, you want to grow and you want to do the right thing. And then hopefully you can see like, okay, now I'm ready to do some hard things. I'm going to keep my heart pure. I'm going to be real all the time. Blessed are the pure. I'm going to be a peacemaker. I'm going to keep my conversations going with people that I haven't talked to. I'm going to try and be willing to talk to them about it so I'm not flighting, running away from my problems, or just attacking my problems. I want to be a peacemaker. And then finally, Lord, give me the grace to do really, really hard things so people know that my faith is worth it. And this is true. 
I hope you can be convinced in your hearts and minds that the word of God is true and it will change your life and it will help you. Because you know who's coming along? Jesus is here to take that broken reed and to take that smoldering wick and here to set the captive free. He's here to heal the brokenhearted. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word, and thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be here. I hope I've encouraged them to read your word, to learn it, to live it, even when it's hard. And we know that this world is not our home. Pray that you continue to give our hope and our satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to grow in our walk with him and to see that he redeemed us, he's forgiven us, he's given us all we need in Christ. Well, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.